Hello fellow Spare Parts Army, I'm your host Chris Cappy, and before we get into today's episode about the lessons learned from trench warfare in World War I, I need to show off my new watch from our partner Avalot North America. Now that I have a watch, I can finally remember when to eat breakfast on time. It's like having your own personal squad leader on your wrist reminding you when it's time for your bi-weekly teeth brushing. It also reminds me when to do really sweet product placement shots of the watch. Wow, my arms are hairy. Avalot North America is veteran owned and operated. They provide high quality watches with the mission to give back to our veteran and first responder communities. Each watch is on a limited run. Once they sell out, they won't be remade. So just use code TASK to get 10% off your watch and then we can synchronize our entire lives together. Click the link in the description to get yours today. Being in a trench during World War I would mean you were experiencing some of the worst conditions that soldiers have ever been subjected to. But out of these horrible conditions, we had troops who were forced into figuring out new ways of organizing to defeat the enemy. A group of nine troops, each with a different weapon and special role, didn't really exist before 1917. Let's find out how the Great War led to our modern infantry squad tactics. During World War I, the smallest troop size that operated independently was usually a platoon of around 40 to 80 soldiers. The US Army doctrine and tactics at the time were to send entire regiments across no man's land in hope that their human waves would overwhelm the enemy. Those regiments were organized around their weapons. You would have a machine gun section, a grenadier section, a rifle company. This also made it easier to bulk train troops on their weapon system. Don't worry though, there will always be soldiers like me where no matter how you train me on any weapon system, I will still never qualify with an expert badge. So as World War I progressed, resources were dwindling fast for everyone. They had to get creative. They came up with this idea of mixing soldiers with different weapons into small squads. This was completely against the standard operating procedure before the First World War. Sure, it sounds like an obvious idea to us today, but many officers thought it was a dumb experiment back then when the small squad setup was first introduced. Since the dawn of war, armies relied on massive faceless rank and file assaults. So the notion of turning the infantry into a smaller, more independent force was understandably a very revolutionary thought for the time. Why would you want to give the infantry more independence? What are they going to do with it? They might run away. So the Germans were the first to come up with these small squad units. They began testing these squads out near the end of the war. The Germans realized that the massive assaults across no man's land with huge amounts of troops was not going to win the war for them. They also couldn't afford to continue the old style of tactics because they were running out of resources. So they started to form smaller and more agile nine soldier squads. They were more like a special forces A team of today. These small squads would infiltrate enemy lines at night or perform harassing fire from behind enemy lines. Since they were smaller in number, it was easier for them to slip behind the lines unnoticed. These hit and run tactics were only possible because they had the advantage of speed on their side. Can you imagine being a soldier during World War I and crawling out from the safety of the trench with eight other soldiers? Then you would have to make your way through no man's land behind enemy lines and all of this would be done at night with zero visibility. That would be a terrifying experience. Of all the wars in human history, World War I is definitely the last one I would want to be a part of. The idea of having almost zero agency in whether you live or die is terrifying because you had to charge straight at the enemy lines. In today's wars or ancient battles, your skill as a soldier might save you in a pinch. Whereas in World War I, it truly was just a roll of the dice a lot of times. Eventually, each side was experimenting with new and unconventional ways to disrupt the battlefield. The British invested heavily in creating the first ever tanks. They hoped that these armored tanks would be able to drive straight across the German line and break up their defenses. This would leave a hole for the infantry regiments to follow on through. Unfortunately, early tank tactics had a huge learning curve. The British and American forces saw the potential for using tanks on the battlefield, but without the tactics and standard operating procedures fully figured out yet, they were still too risky to employ. 
The armor wasn't thick enough to consistently stop rifle rounds, and the engine wasn't powerful enough to support thicker armor. While the Allies toyed around with the semi-useless tanks, the German war machine continued their efforts in making the infantry squad more effective. By 1918, a German platoon was made up of 45 men divided into four squads. Does that sound familiar? It should. This is almost the exact same setup as the modern day US Army platoon. This reduction in troop personnel allowed the Germans to form new regiments without increasing the number of men in uniform. The smaller squads also proved beneficial once modern automatic weapons were invented. Large regiment sized squads fighting shoulder to shoulder would suffer major losses from artillery and machine gun fire. This new need to create space between the ranks was exactly the opposite of the old tactics that had been taught for thousands of years. Hold the line, as it was called, was the key to victory in past wars. Victory or defeat depended on which side could best hold a tight formation of thousands of soldiers, and that's where discipline really comes into play. Smaller teams of nine have since proven to be the perfect number. It allows each modern infantry team to be equipped with enough firepower that each soldier can carry a different specialized weapon and become a harder target for machine gun and artillery. The Germans also were the first side to produce a lightweight two-man machine gun. This created a small, flexible team that had a mix of rifles, machine guns, and grenadiers. At the time, the US Army had those assets split into different sections. So you would have one platoon of machine gunners and a separate platoon of grenadiers. Organizing the forces that way was a traditional way of doing things. So mixing them up into smaller teams composed of different weapon types was completely revolutionary. A fascinating development that came directly from tactics used on the battlefield during World War I was the trench watch. Before the Great War, civilians weren't necessarily wearing wrist watches. However, the techniques required for successful trench warfare during the First War changed that. How, you ask? First, the human wave attacks needed to be coordinated. This was done by having every man in the unit synchronize their wristwatch to guarantee that everything happened simultaneously. Second, watches also synchronized artillery fire since the firing positions were spread across miles. Lastly, since the attacks usually happened during the early morning hours, right before sunrise, the watch's dials had to be luminously coded, ensuring that everyone would be able to read the time in the dark. If the officers got the timing for the attack wrong, it would be a disaster. Time to go over the top, chaps! Oh, wait, I forgot to set my watch 30 minutes early. Sorry about that. Come on back. False alarm. False alarm. Whoops. Us officers can't be good at everything. You can tell a lot about someone by their timepiece of choice. I had an old squad leader who carried around a pocket watch. That's how I knew he was secretly a hipster. The Great War was the first time the British Army had their generals far behind the front line. Yes, by that point, the front line had become such a disgusting and dangerous place that the top brass officers didn't want anything to do with it. A consequence of that was that communicating orders to the front line units became difficult. Those orders would have to travel miles and miles before they were received. Performing a coordinated maneuver that utilized thousands of troops at the same time was key to the success of the human wave assault tactic. Visual and audio signals that were successful in the past, like trumpets, didn't work over these great distances. Orders would be sent out in advance and would read like the following. The attack will start at such and such time. Everyone's trench watches needed to be synchronized for this reason. It was legitimately a matter of life or death if your timepiece was off by 30 seconds. Because it could mean that your squad was going to go over the top of the trench and be exposed before everyone else, which would make you a very easy target. The American Expeditionary Force had their own unique set of experiences during the First World War. The top army brass changed their doctrine to reflect the German infantry tactics that they learned during trench warfare. With the novel inventions of machine guns, grenades, tanks, and aircraft, they knew that they needed to redefine the role of the infantry squad. They knew that it was time for a more small, independent fighting force. So here's something really fascinating. I was reading some articles the other day about how today's Army and Marine Corps are still 
again, redefining the way that they operate on the modern battlefield. The US military infantry is reorganizing in order to have a smaller footprint and to be able to operate even more independently. When weapons are powerful enough to destroy consolidated expensive assets like aircraft carriers and tanks with ease, the tactics start to change and you begin to need to spread out more and more. The Great War continues to directly influence our lives even to this day. Evidence of this can be found simply by looking down at your wrist. If you don't see a watch there, or even if you do, you need to buy one from Avalot North America. They're veteran owned and they offer high quality timepieces that have been tested by our very own first responders and military communities. Use code TASK TASK to get 10% off your order. When you do, Avalot North America will donate a portion of the proceeds to the Headstrong Project. Since 2012, the Headstrong Project has provided effective and free mental health care treatment for post 9-11 military veterans and their families. Now, when you look down at your wrist, you can share in the incredible history of the men who kept this nation alive and support the continued care of our warfighters. Thank you for watching the video. Please remember to like and subscribe. I'm your host, Chris Cappy. Task and Purpose out.